promoting future of technology in NEP, approaches, opportunities, and challenges. Gracing this panel, we are pleased to have with us Dr. K. Karunakaran, CEO, Hindustan Educational Institute, Coimbatore. Next, we have CVR Murthy, Chair Professor, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Dr. Jamshid Barucha, Founding Vice Chancellor, Sai University, Chennai. Dr. C. Manoharan, Chairman, NG Hospital and Research Center, Coimbatore. Dr. Sivaji Chandram, Vice Chancellor, Savita University. Professor S. Salvihan and Vice Chancellor Veltik Rangarajan, Dr. Saguntala R&D Institute of Science and Technology. Can we have a round of applause, please? Vanakam and a very good morning to all of you. Thank you so much uh, for investing your time today in the morning during this Elite Higher Education Summit. Thank you, Elites, for inviting all of us for this wonderful meet. My name is Karanagaran. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Hindustan Group of Institutions, Coimbatore, where in which I'm managing 11 institutions with about 22,000 students in several other categories, engineering, art, science, management, paramedical science, what not. Friends, uh, the education sector of our country, India, is the second largest uh, in the world. If you take the school education, about 15 lakh uh, schools are there, 25 crore students study in our school education sector, and we have about 89 lakh teachers working in the school sector. If you come to higher education side, about 3.7 crore students right now undergoing the higher education in India. In about 1,000 uh, universities, and the numbers are increasing day by day. And we also have colleges, affiliated colleges, autonomous colleges, standalone programs. There are about uh, 37,000 institutions of that kind in India. So we live in India. Uh, friends, the national education policy, we all know that, which was passed uh, during 2020 July. And we are on the verge of converting ourselves. If we are an institution head, especially higher education head, whatever capacity you are holding as a vice chancellor or director or principal. In the recent days, almost for every week, we receive notifications either from Ministry of Education or from UGC in the light of NEP implementation. Even the NAC initially said in his manual, are you ready with the preparedness? And they have added another question now. What is the best practice you are following? for that NEP component. Even we are not ready to implement, that is the real status with respect to many of the institutions. Of course, some of the private universities are moving forward. The ef uh, effective implementation of NEP is being monitored with the, the, with the framework of the UGCR Ministry of Education in terms of uh, Multidisciplinary campus, I think we have already received the notification. Just few days back, we have received another notification from UGC, allowing students, I mean international students, to undergo in Indian campuses, over and above the sanction intake. At the implementation of academic bank of credits, credit transfer facilities, twinning with foreign universities, of course, technology integration is also part of the NEP implementation. It clearly means that we are moving forward and shifting ourselves as per the recommendations of the National Education Policy 2020. The technology integration in NEP 2020 
framework is clearly spelled out in the chapters 23 and 24. Chapter 23 of NEP manual talks about technology use and integration. The chapter 24 talks about online and digital education. The most important aspects of uh, this uh, technology policy are investment in digital infrastructure, development of online teaching platforms and resources, creation of uh, virtual laboratories and digital repos repositories, training the teachers to become high quality online content creators, developing and implementing online tests, and uh, defining content, technology, and pedagogy standards for online teaching and learning. The policy calls for uh, the establishment of a dedicated unit to plan the growth of digital technology, digital content, and the capacity building for both school and the higher education's e-education needs. The establishment of a National Educational Technology Forum, NETF, we shall operate as a platform for a free exchange of ideas and use of technology to enhance learning, assessment planning, and administration in higher education side. So the need to embrace technology in professional and higher education, education, as well as the incorporation of technology to expedite uh, the aim of achieving 100% literacy has also been put forward through this NEP. Intention is very clear, very, very clear intention. It is worth mentioning John Davis' uh, famous remark. If we teach uh, today's students as we thought yesterday's, we rob them tomorrow. It's worth mentioning here. Uh, friends, with respect to this uh, technology integration, with respect to this NEP manual, Today, we have an amazing panel on decoding future of technology in NEP, where we will be talking about its approaches, opportunities, and challenges. For this, along with me, you will find academic leaders on the stage. Panelists are from IIT, universities, as well as from affiliated institutions. But before uh, we dive into the panel discussion, because I find time. Earlier, they were listed with eight panelists. Now, only six are there. So I'm taking a little more time. Uh, we would like to understand that how many of uh, the participants, because that will be helpful for our panelists to throw lights in the same line. May I understand how many of you are from academic institutions? I think most of you are from academic institutions. Maybe I would like to understand that. Is there anyone uh, from EdTech company sitting here? Okay, I think they are the other side, I believe. And anyone from other than EdTech Academy? Other than EdTech and Academy? Yes, probably from, I think, Sankar Coaching Institute also, IAS Coaching also, also here, fine. That's awesome, thank you. Our goal today is uh, clear, whatever role you play in your esteemed institution, this panel team is going to throw some light on the decoding future of technology in NEP. I would like to throw some light what you can expect from this panel. We would like to take a few moments for each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves and also tell a little bit about how the technology integration has started in their own organization. Then I will just kick off with uh, some conversation, asking some questions to our panelists. Maybe at the end, if time I'm available, I would like to just uh, give about five to 10 minutes the floor to open for any of your questions. So with this, we would like to get started. I request the panelist may take about three to five minutes in the initial uh, round. Probably we need a few more rounds, time for a few more rounds. So with this uh, brief note, maybe I would like to start with uh, the senior most professor who is representing IIT Madras here in our panel, Professor C.V.R. Murthy. Professor, I would like to just uh, like to invite you to share 
how IIT is getting ready with this technology integration into our, your academic system. Over to you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, if I look at uh, the uh, national education policy, it mentions technology 77 times. And uh, about 60 times it's related to digital technologies for learning. And uh, the remaining are general cursory mention of the word technology. Uh, and only one occasion it says that we need to create new technologies for the need to meet the needs of the nation. And that is what I will focus on in my discussion. And uh, when I look at uh, the pointed question that uh, he has asked, uh, what is IIT doing in terms of preparing for technology? Where we stand today is that our faculty members take about 20 years to prepare themselves. And the first 20 years is the training. After 20 years is when they are able to give back to the nation through very pointed, subject-oriented uh, challenges that they are taking up to solve the questions of the nation. So why I'm saying this is that it takes time to really train the faculty member and align the thought of the faculty member to address the needs of the nation. So that will be the first point that I'm mentioning about how IIT is preparing to face the uh, challenges of the nation, technology challenges of the nation. The second point is that when I look at the uh, education side, uh, I think that is not yet aligned uh, in a sync. Why, why, why am I saying this? Uh, competence building has three parts. First is positive attitude, skill, and knowledge. These are the three components of competence development. In the undergraduate education, we are supposed to address positive attitude. In the master's education, we are supposed to add skills, and in the doctoral education, we are supposed to add knowledge, and eventually after 10 years, they are ready to get started with their work. They're not yet competent because competence development is in five cycles throughout our life. And the third cycle completes at college. The fourth is in employment and fifth is at retirement. So we are looking at an undergraduate program where earlier we had 70% technology content, 30% non-technology content. And today we have reversed it like the rural urban migration. We are having about 30% compulsory uh, content related to the domain in which the student has registered. And also the contact hours have reduced from 36 to 20. All this with the hope that students will spend time in focusing on technology. But uh, we are not yet uh, in a stable state. We are still in the transition state. And we are hoping that uh, eventually the programs will stabilize and we are able to focus the attention of the students to technology. We are not able to do that yet. The students come in with the national mindset that they want employment, and all the employment today that they are thinking of is only related to IT. So any subject that they are in, they are only looking out to graduate and get to uh, IT employment. I would say the measure of the success of higher education will depend on how many of our students seek to doing a master's degree after bachelor's program in their subject domain. That will be a measure of our, a true measure of our inspiration that we are offering to students in the colleges across the country. On that front, we have a long way to go. I have many more points, but I'll stop here for the moment to uh, hand over the mic to our colleagues. Uh, that's very interesting, Professor. Thank you for the initial note. Uh, I would like to just go to uh, Professor Salivahanan, uh, the Vice Chancellor of uh, Veltech Rangarajan, uh, Dr. Shakuntala R&D Institute for Science and Technology, Chennai. Dignitaries on the dais and off the dais, good morning to everyone. Actually, in our university, Veltech University, uh, we are preparing for NEP in six categories, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, second one, academic bank of credits, 
தேர்ட் ஒன் ஸ்கில் டெவலப்மெண்ட் ஃபோர்த் ஒன் அப்ரோப்ரியேட் இன்டக்ரேஷன் ஆஃப் இண்டியன் நாலேஜ் சிஸ்டம் ஃபிஃப்த் ஒன் ஃபோக்கஸ் ஆன் அவுட் கம் பேஸ்ட் எஜுகேஷன் அண்டு சிக்ஸ்த் ஒன் டிஸ்டன்ஸ் எஜுகேஷன் ஆன்லைன் எஜுகேஷன் வேல்டெக் யூனிவர்சிட்டி ஹேஸ் ஏ கண்டியூசிவ் அண்ட் கமிட்டட் எஜுகேஷனல் ஒர்க் என்விரான்மெண்ட் ஃபார் டீச்சிங் லேர்னிங் இன்னோவேஷன் அண்ட் ரிசர்ச் த நியூ ரெகுலேஷன் இன் லைன் வித் என்இபி டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி ப்ரொவைட்ஸ் ஆன் ஆப்பர்ச்சுனிட்டி ஃபார் தி ஸ்டூடெண்ட்ஸ் டு என்ரிஸ் தேர் நாலேஜ் இன் மல்டி டிசிப்ளினரி இன்டர் டிசிப்ளினரி ஏரியாஸ் த வேல்டெக் யூனிவர்சிட்டி ஆஃபர்ஸ் மைனர் டிகிரி ஃபார் ஆல் பிடெக் டிகிரி ப்ரோக்ராம்ஸ் த அப்ஜெக்டிவ் இஸ் டு ப்ரொவைட் அடிஷனல் லேர்னிங் ஆப்பர்ச்சுனிட்டிஸ் ஃபார் அட்வான்ஸ் லேர்னர்ஸ் அக்ராஸ் தி ப்ரெட் ஆஃப் தி இன்ஜினியரிங் அண்ட் டு ப்ரொவைட் இன்டர் டிசிப்ளினரி நாலேஜ் அண்ட் வி ப்ரொவைட் ஓப்பன் எலக்டிவ்ஸ் த கோர்சஸ் அண்டர் திஸ் கேட்டகரி கவர் இன்டர் டிசிப்ளினரி ட்ரான்ஸ் டிசிப்ளினரி நாலேஜ் ஸ்டூடெண்ட்ஸ் செல் ரிஜிஸ்டர் ஃபார் அப்ரோப்ரியேட் எலக்டிவ்ஸ் ஆஃபர்ட் இன் அதர் ஸ்கூல்ஸ் த ஃபவுண்டேஷன் கோர்சஸ் இன் தி ஃபஸ்ட் இயர் ஆஃப் ஸ்டடி integrates the humanities and arts with the stem which leads to the increase in critical thinking abilities higher order thinking and deeper learning etc the conceive design implement operate that is cdio we call practice in the first year curricula is a cutting edge educational framework designed to develop the next generation of engineering leaders the btech degree programs provide specialization courses to meet the latest innovative development towards multidisciplinary perspectives a student can transfer credits from one school to another and from one institution to another through credit transfer students are encouraged to undergo projects in the multidisciplinary mode by formulating teams for participating in various contests they are given special attention towards innovation and entrepreneurship training related activities to meet the standards specified by nep students with the innovation driven prototype business models are used to find solutions to society related ch- challenges they are supported by the veltec technology business incubator in order to engage them in more than multidisciplinary research endeavors and come up with a startup through the initiation of new multidisciplinary centers the faculty members get autonomy to choose curriculum methodology pedagogy and evaluation models within the given policy framework cbcs that is a choice based credit system offers flexibility towards students multidisciplinary learning international internships industrial collaborative projects and the students startups also enrich the students skills in a wider space welter has already taken all the necessary initiatives to fulfill the requirements for adopting the academic bank of credits as proposed by the national education policy 2020 the institution makes consistent efforts to strengthen the vocational education and the soft skills of students in alignment with the national skills qualification framework the list of programs offered to train the students on skill development is mentioned as cnc programming and operational techniques 150 students were trained specialized course on welding te- technologies 30 students specialized course on pcb design and assembly 200 students were trained skill development courses on various 3d printing techniques 500 students were trained value added courses on design tools 500 students were trained nep 2020 was implemented with a view to bring changes in the existing educational practices which are confined to certain limitations the new policy introduced by our honorable prime minister is made to cater to the needs of students from different 
echelons of the society. The previous education system had linguistic and cultural barriers. To overcome such uh, hurdles, NEP 2020 offers a scope to the students to study anywhere in India with the confidence. This uh, policy also helps to learn all ancient Indian languages. The students will be able to learn the different cultures of India when they have bilingual and multilingual usage in their learning places. In this connection, Valtech uh, Institute is to integrate Indian knowledge system and prepare Indian language, culture and tradition. The institution gives more, utmost importance to celebrating traditional Indian festivals. The institution toils to preserve and promote ancient Indian classical languages and cultural practices. At present, the institution offers two courses that aim to inculcating classical Tamil in young minds, namely Tirukural and uh, Aati Chudi. Students sir, are uh, encouraged. Professor, sorry for the interference. Uh, okay. Professor, can we take Please it sir. as a discussion? Okay, okay. okay. Uh, the institution started to implement outcome-based education in teaching learning process from the academic year 2013-14. And there are some good practices of the institution pertaining to the OBE in view of uh, NEP. Choice-based credit system creates flexibility to choose their learning trajectories based on their talents and interests. Students are exposed to multidisciplinary areas through the courses offered other schools in the institution. The curriculum has flexibility for student mobility, allowing them to accumulate the credits in order to continue th their education. Involving the students in intensive programs and other skill-based activities to make them industry-ready societal contributions. Extensive use of technologies in teaching learning for effective content delivery pertaining to the OBE. Professor, I think... With, I so think with this uh, few words, I conclude this. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank, Thank you. you. That's interesting. And it seems uh, you have already started completely impl implementing the NEP directions in Welltech University. Thank you so much for your initial remark. Uh, I would like to come to uh, Dr. Swaji uh, Chandram, the Vice Chancellor of Savita University, in age old university here in Chennai, maybe for your initial remarks, sir. How you are ready and you have started preparing, uh, integrating technology as per NEP in your university. You can take the mic, sir. Thank you, Professor Karnakaran and uh, my distinguished uh, panelists and uh, esteemed uh, uh, educationalists and industry uh, leaders and then uh, honorable vice chancellors of uh, different universities, ladies and gentlemen. So at the very outset, uh, I compliment uh, the Elites organization for uh, uh, bringing all the eminent uh, educational leaders uh, in, on the single platform and also I would uh, very much uh, uh, seen here, so for the past uh, 25 years uh, as a government uh, official promoting the science and technology in the country, I have been the strong uh, advocate of uh, industry academy collaborations, which uh, is happening in this day today. A lot of uh, industries relevant to the education as well as the academic uh, leaders are actually coming together to address uh, some of the issues uh, that have been uh, chalked out in the national education policy. Uh, I would urge all of you, see, uh, education, when you say it is an industry, uh, all universities are educational institutes. One thing one has to remember is our product is the student. So, the how best we can uh, refine our product, uh, which is uh, sellable in future. And also, I consider all our alumni as the sold products. So, therefore, we need to take warranty of the products sold by the universities. So therefore, when you uh, groom your uh, student or your product, highly skilled in every respect, whether it is a curricular activity or extracurricular activity, so they are our brand ambassadors. So therefore, uh, 
the coming back to the point of uh, technology interventions or decoding of the future uh, NEP. So there are several uh, things uh, which have been brought under a single uh, visionary document, uh, NEP 2020, where uh, some of the things we have been already doing as an educational institutes, but uh, we need to put them in a very streamed uh, uh, way in order to uh, produce the best uh, talented students. Uh, as, as I have to tell you one thing here, uh, I was in uh, Japan for almost uh, uh, six years as a PDF as well as uh, as a science counselor of India to Japan in our own embassy. Our Indian students are the sought after uh, products across the globe, uh, whether it is a student from IIT or a student from any other university. So therefore, there is a lot of demand for our uh, products that is the student. Uh, once again, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, during the course of this panel discussion, I would like to interact more and uh, maybe I would like to tell some of the best practices where uh, Savita University has been practicing. And uh, I would like to just to quickly uh, tell you all, uh, maybe you are all aware, our Savita University Dental College has been ranked number one in India in NRF uh, rankings, uh, though it is a private university. And also it has secured uh, number 18th rank across the globe in QS uh, rankings 2022. So it's not a small thing. So we have been uh, investing a lot in our uh, uh, government national institutes and universities and so on and so forth. But a uh, small private university sitting in a uh, corner of uh, Tamil Nadu has been ranked very high in any subject. So this has to be uh, very carefully actually uh, seen by each one of us uh, to perform better. And uh, the performers, there is always a scope for, and uh, there is always a great recognition by the whole uh, uh, the world uh, community of educationalists and as well as uh, research activities. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, and uh, we appreciate for your ranking of uh, Savida uh, in the national level as well as in the international level. Thank you for the note. Uh, now I would like to come to the same question to the founding vice chancellor of Sai University, Dr. Jamshid Barucha, who did his uh, uh, graduation and uh, a PhD degree from Harvard University and worked in U.S. universities landed in India for developing the newly started Sai University in Chennai. Over to you, sir, for your uh, initial remarks on how the technology is taken uh, into the incorporation into our education system. Thank you very much. Um, yes, after 40 years in the U.S. in higher education, I'd always wanted to do something in India, but the government bureaucracy in higher education did not allow much innovation. <clears throat> so when I saw the NEP draft, I got really excited. Finally, it's a liberation, uh, liberalization of the sector. And um, came back to India to partner with the uh, founder, sponsor of Sai University, Mr. K.V. Ramani, an entrepreneur, to create a truly innovative university. <clears throat> and in my discussions with him about, you know, should I do this or should I not, um, India is not an easy place to get things done, I think we all know. I laid down one condition, which is under no circumstances and at no time am I going to listen to anybody who tells me you cannot do this or you cannot do that because that or you have to do this or you have to do that because that's the way it's done. Unless it's required by law. Obviously, we have to follow established regulations. <clears throat> but if you actually dig deep, regulations are no longer the biggest challenge because NEP has really given private universities the license to innovate. And we're taking that 
we're, we're taking that promissory note and not doing things simply because that's the way they were done. We're taking it from founding principles. So my, what are the founding principles? Well, uh, if I had a longer talk, I'd talk more about that, but just in summary, my own field is cognitive neuroscience. How thinking arises from the brain, basically. How all of our cognitive faculties, almost everything we do as humans, is done by the brain. Uh, and there is a tremendous amount of research now in cognitive neuroscience that the way educational institutions are organized and curriculum is devised and pedagogies are designed is not aligned well with how the brain learns, okay? Uh, so that's premise number one, particularly for undergraduates. Now, I've, of course, K through 12 schools, that's a different discussion, but we are in higher education. For postgraduate, PhD, professional training, it's a little bit different. But for undergraduates, they are adolescents, okay? And we know a lot, actually, about the adolescent brain. And uh, a lot of it is just in the last 10 years, tremendous amount of research. When parents and teachers say, you know, I don't understand these adolescents, this and that, the other, why don't they listen, why don't they do that? Well, we have some answers to do that, to that now. We need to actually work with the brains that we get among our students. And if you listen carefully to kids instead of just lecturing at them, and you look at the research, you get tremendous insights about how you can l leverage that talent. We all know India has the largest youth population in the world. And, but in order to make that a dividend rather than a liability, their talents have to be unleashed and developed. And the traditional educational models don't do that. They're stifling. Okay? Um, now, this is not just me being radical. The, the language in NEP is extremely radical. It talks about the system being dysfunctional. And, and, and that's where we start from, is disrupting. Not reforming, but disrupting the system. And just uh, briefly, our motto is spark the imagination, liberate the mind. Okay? We have to start from the understanding that our children bring a tremendous amount of potential for new knowledge, for new uh, ideas, for new products, for new technologies. And if we just tell them, no, no, this is what you have to learn, that is what you have to learn, this is how you have to learn it, that's how you have to learn it, that stifles their imagination. Of course, you have to master current knowledge, but our balance must shift from just mastering existing knowledge to developing new knowledge and new technologies, which means a different way of thinking about teaching. Not teaching as transferring knowledge of imparting information, but teaching as faculty bringing students into the process of discovery, experimentation, and intellectual risk taking. Traditionally, we have punished students for making mistakes. Mistakes is actually the most important way to learn. Anybody who's done a lot of coding knows you cannot write good software unless you do have bugs. That's when you really learn. And so that's the kind of active learning ecosystem we want to create. And the last thing I'll say about that is just that um, the technology yeah. incorporation is happening in your uh, So on the education. technology side, what we want to do is to provide students with the, with the best technology platforms and give them the space and the encouragement and the guidance to innovate with it. If you see, you take a group of students and you ask them to just come up with a project. 
instead of telling them what the project is. And say, look, we're here as guides to, to, to give you advice, to, to tell you what, et cetera, et cetera. But you come up with it. What you see is that the technological innovations are huge. So that's what I'm saying. The last thing I'll say is that we make a big mistake uh, as educators, as uh, regulatory agencies, be it uh, UGC or AICTE, in thinking we can predict future technology. Okay? Nobody has been able to predict what the big technologies are going to be in the future. Uh, certainly, nobody who's in an establishment position today. Okay? So the people who are best able to predict it are the people who are going to create it, who are our students. And I can give you some very good examples of that, uh, but uh, in the interest of time, just to say, we need, India has the best talent in the world, and everybody now wants it. But Indians do fabulously well abroad with innovation, and they don't innovate very much in India. Okay? So we have to create the ecosystems here so that the talent we have here is, is, is expressed, and technology is the way uh, it should be done. The next big thing in technology should come out of India. Okay? The, the, uh, this kind of thing should come out of India. But that means a f complete change in the attitude of us as educators. We need to stop lecturing our students and start encouraging them to take the kinds of risks that somebody like Steve Jobs took. Okay? Yeah, re really, that's happening, sir. I think through yeah. this NEP, right, uh, the uh, active-based learning or experience learning is really put into the campuses uh, nowadays. Maybe uh, I will take uh, this as your note uh, uh, for the initial moment now. Thank you, Fru, sir. Uh, I'm coming to a medical practitioner who is running an hospital in Coimbatore, namely NG Hospital, now uh, turned himself as an academic head, started uh, his own institutions, but affiliated institutions. We would like to hear from uh, Dr. Manogaran how he is managing uh, his paramedical colleges and health science colleges uh, uh, as recommended by the NEP, how he is uh, taking technology into the teaching, learning, and uh, academic process in his institution. Professor Manakuran. Respected <coughs> moderator Dr. Karunagran and uh, co panelist people from various educational institutions, vice chancellors, good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I thank uh, ELTS for giving me this opportunity. <coughs> I am a surgeon and endoscopist, having my 200 bed at multi specialty hospital in Coimbatore. Uh, so I am a different specialty healthcare industry. So all of the panelists are from uh, educational institutions. So how we have digitized our uh, hospital, first of all, I'll tell you how to. Two years back, we started to digitizing our hospital. So first, first, we have a strong IT head. So we has trained all our staffs, <coughs> doctors, everybody is trained. Now our hospital is fully digitalized. So we have got all records, everything has been, medical records department, everything has been digitalized. So that there is a less usage of papers first. Secondly, so you had, it is a, India is the second uh, largest uh, country after China using the internet. La many people are using the internet. So it is easy for us to understand and uh, we can train our people. <coughs> so everything, e-prescription, and doctors can prescribe from their desktop and prescription, prescription will go to the pharmacy. There is no, uh, there is no Mistakes has been happened during the prescription and everything has been clearly given. And after that, we have started our uh, paramedical institute. During the pandemic period, we have digitalized our library first. So librarian is a, next to IT offices, librarian can easily understand, they can easily, digital transformation can be done. So 
our students are gave a online classes and they can learn from their own home uh, from the digital library so that's how we have trained our paramedical institute and our hospitals the teaching learning process sir what sir how about the teaching learning process students whether they are put into some technology platform for learning yes sir yes, sir teaching is a it's a digital transformation easy for learning and teaching and the institution to understand this uh, this things from digital transformation sir thank you so much sir uh, i would like to start again uh, from here this time uh, professor can you just uh, tell the challenges what you have faced with respect to your teachers when you start adopting some of the technology tools during the pandemic time really so uh, mr chairman again for uh, asking me this question see the pandemic has actually brought a uh, lot of innovations in spite of its uh, negative impacts uh, during this period uh, not necessarily the university and medical fraternity but it has uh, taught us uh, a lot of new innovations, particularly in the technology-related aspects. Uh, the so-called uh, online meetings and all have actually emerged out of this uh, necessity. So necessity is the mother of invention, as uh, we say. So uh, during the pandemic period, uh, every one of us uh, had been very alert uh, on, uh, firstly, how to uh, tackle this uh, difficult uh, challenge uh, of the movement of the people uh, or uh, movement in the sense that uh, personal touching of uh, items as well as uh, uh, human beings also was very, had been very difficult. So during that period, uh, actually we at uh, Savita had uh, organized uh, several camps uh, in the camp, uh, in our own uh, campus, uh, Tandalam campus where our uh, a huge medical hospital and other establishments are there. So through these camps, uh, we have been uh, able to help the people uh, uh, for the vaccination related activities as well as uh, uh, other uh, do's and don'ts uh, for the patients as well as the faculty also. And this is how we have been uh, able to address uh, some of the issues and uh, uh, people from nearby uh, villages also we have been uh, tapping them and uh, our student community and uh, young doctors uh, were able to reach out to the uh, people who are unable to come to the hospitals and then uh, uh, almost uh, bedridden kind of uh, patients also. So maybe I think uh, we, there, are, there, there have been very best practices uh, in the campus I uh, see uh, during the pandemic. Uh, not only at our university, but uh, across the country, uh, every hospital, every uh, doctor, or even nursing uh, practitioners, practitioners, they all have been very uh, alert and uh, I'm very sorry to uh, say that we have lost uh, uh, some of the people also across the country, those who have thoroughly worked for the uh, saving the lives, so they have lost their lives. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Salivaganan, sir, uh, you, you said in your initial remark that uh, your, your university is uh, mostly concentrating on engineering programs. Uh, no, we could hear from uh, the medical uh, university side. So what kind of challenges uh, you really faced with respect to your teachers or teaching process when you started uh, integrating the technology tools into your academic system? And how you have you, you are able to come out uh, from such challenges. Because I, I find mostly the engineering college principals, deans yeah. sitting here. Actually, in our uh, university, uh, we, we have a uh, uh, technology business incubator. Uh, that section is uh, doing well for the benefit of students. Uh, we get uh, permission from industries for uh, students' uh, projects. Because the industries give uh, uh, problems, that, uh, that is, you know, we can say day-to-day uh, -day problem, whatever they have, they are giving. And our students are going there for a six to nine months period. And uh, they are solving their problems. 
and uh, moreover we have facilities uh, with the help of uh, uh, dst and uh, we are following this uh, cdio system also framework and uh, with this uh, students are very happy uh, being in campus and uh, as well as uh, they go to industries do you start offering uh, online courses sir, from yeah, online courses uh, we have not yet started you are starting yeah no. okay uh, maybe i would like to come to uh, professor uh, murthy sir uh, sir iit is uh, known for uh, your e content preparation well ahead of uh, uh, the pandemic time, only uh, during pandemic, after pandemic, most of the institutions started thinking about e-resources. Whereas with respect to IIT, you, you are successful in offering one BSc module course, uh, data sciences. I believe that about, not less than about 20,000 students enroll uh, every academic year, and you have been successfully running. So how uh, this is possible and what kind of uh, learning atmosphere is created in that online platform, sir? The uh, success of the data science program is market driven because the market needs people to be analysts for the huge data that they have. Uh, so we didn't have the challenge of trying to campaign for a program. But fortunately for us, the faculty members of computer science and engineering, they had already gone through the drill of this program for two decades before. And so they picked the select courses which are supposed to be the baseline courses and uh, thanks to pandemic, uh, it got accelerated. But before that itself, they had converted that into digital platform. Uh, and uh, they successfully managed to give the subject in smaller modules, which are easy for the students to capture. For example, one concept, one module, and one unit. That made it easy for them. And I'm uh, clear that uh, uh, the early program that we have, the certificate program, uh, is going to catch up and a lot more people will uh, take interest in that. A lot more, when I say more other universities also will uh, try to start their own programs and they have started also. Uh, that won't be a challenge. Uh, so in a sense what is happening is this is a skill-based program. It will be successful. The challenge for higher education institutes is when you have knowledge-based programs, how do you uh, sort of convey knowledge across a digital platform? For sure, two years of uh, pandemic told us audio off, video off system that the students were participating in uh, is not the model for transmitting knowledge. Uh, because we are not trying to get them to get skilled. We are trying to get them to get educated. And if you know Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda, he said, education is concentration of mind, not collection of facts. So that calm has to come in the student's mind. And so they need to come, sit down, huddle, and then give themselves an opportunity to concentrate. And that is what I'm hoping that the campuses will do uh, in time ahead. Uh, but uh, see, now, now, now the NEP wants even the engineering programs content to be in online. Uh, even the aeronautical engineering student are now subjected to a maximum of about 20% or 30% in online with Swayam platform or Courser or whatever it may be. So I want your comment on that also, sir. Yeah, sure. See, what's happening is there's a great shortage of teachers today. Uh, especially on the engineering platform. The reason is, last 30 years, uh, less than 5% of the students went for masters and there, again, a bigger drop for the PhD program. So the quality of students that we are, uh, faculty members, young faculty members we are getting, are, is, is very difficult for us to say that we will sustain the next 20 years of higher education. Uh, we are competing against each other, which should not be the situation. I would pray in a very healthy environment, all the institutes should be able to get enough teachers. We are not getting that because ourselves, we were not inspiring enough for the students to come back and take to education as a profession, uh, teaching as a profession. And I'm uh, looking at uh, the matter of uh, uh, the, uh, the question that you asked. Can we uh, get a more of our uh, people uh, into uh, the online platform. We will successfully create courses. Students will learn the basics. So there is how and then why. We will convey the how very successfully. But the why part of it will still be a challenge for us. So in the undergraduate program, when we have shortage of teachers, we have 4,000 colleges in technical education, uh, we will be able to help those students who are in colleges where they don't have teachers. That's perfectly fine. So this will be a great service to those students. 
But eventually for technology base of the nation, we require students to come sit and then learn it hands on. And I'm praying that the postgraduate education will be an occasion for us to do that. Uh, thank you so much for your view on this aspect, sir. See, on one side, uh, the government is promoting uh, the technology component into our education system, into all the domains, liberal education, engineering education, professional education. At the same time, uh, the government is promoting uh, online education, online learning. Almost all the private universities now started operating courses through online, whether it is a BCom course or BBA program or data analytics or AIML courses. If this is going to continue, I'm coming to the Vice Chancellor of Sai University. Sir, if this is going to continue, what will be the fate of the physical infrastructure already created for the education system? Yes, that's an excellent question. Let me give you an example of what we're doing at Sai University. And of course, that was helped by in the pandemic, which is uh, we have brought together a very distinguished group of international visiting faculty from top institutions in the world. And um, it's difficult to get those people to come in person. Uh, and during the pandemic, it was impossible. Even now, people are still reluctant to do it. But I think now with the comfort level having gone up about using online uh, communication, we've decided to take full advantage of it. So we have actually a lot of classes that are taught from abroad and um, taught by people who our students would never have an opportunity to learn from here. So for example, the head of the computer science department at Stanford, John Mitchell, okay, is a visiting professor at Sai University and he does uh, several modules on, on blockchain with our students online. Now, he, now that the pandemic is over, he'll come for two weeks here, one week there, but nobody's going to you know, move. And, and, and that, if done correctly, is tremendously impactful to our students. The, the real thing that you need to do with online that we've been experimenting a lot with is active learning. If you just use it as giving lectures, the students are going to fall asleep. Okay? You have to uh, make sure that the, 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 the video uh, platform is used creatively to not only permit interaction with the students and the professor, but to force it. Uh, every, in my view, every single student in every single class should have to speak at some point or another. That's the only way to engage their brains because their minds are somewhere else. They might be physically in the class. We say attendance is required, but they're thinking about something else, okay? And they're also uh, full of gadgets. So uh, the people we have brought as visiting faculty from abroad uh, are very interested in uh, advancing this new idea of using the online platforms for ad active learning. Uh, that where traditionally the MOOCs, the MOOC generation was entirely passive, just watch these videos, okay? Active learning, that's what we're doing. And what we've done is uh, gotten some high uh, magnification cameras. So we have a 20X camera, and the uh, technician or TA uh, in the class can, can uh, operate that. So we have a professor who teaches global challenges. He's sitting in Boston, Professor Sherman Teichman to all of our first year students in all of our schools, they're required to be engaged in what are the big issues of our time globally. And he will call upon a student at random. You know, he'll see the, the list, even if there are 100 students, and he'll call a name. And the, then this 20X camera zooms in on that student. The student is now on the full screen, okay? and. That's the kind of active learning we need, okay? The, the, in people's jobs and their careers, their performance is not going to be based on the kinds of things that made them successful in taking these exams where the, you know, the textbook questions come back to the same, same, same. 
questions. They, they're going to have to communicate. They're going to have to think on their feet. They're going to have to solve novel problems. They're going to have to create arguments. So that's how we are using technology for active uh, forms of learning. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, more online portals, more courses uh, are being offered by the universities in online. Will the physical infrastructure already created what will happen to that physical infrastructure? Well, was, uh, there is, you know, sometimes, um, obviously, we, we're building a new campus now uh, on OMR Pioneer. Uh, we've already started the construction. And um, every day, as I look at how frustrating it is, you know, to, <laughs> to get uh, bricks and mortar actually built and all the systems, I keep thinking more and more, can we come up with a new way of thinking about it? And so I think uh, some kind of hybrid model where we are not as reliant on the physical infrastructure, there will be another pandemic. There will be many more pandemics, okay? New viruses will happen. And we have to be able to pivot immediately. And our students, with our model, they can go on semester abroad, they can go on programs abroad, and stay in their classes here, because they can just connect uh, online. So we are actually taking our physical infrastructure a little bit slowly, trying to focus on the classrooms that we build must be platform, global platforms, where anything can happen and as interactive as possible. And you know, when the students see that, then they don't complain as much about, you know, you don't have this building, you don't have that building, because they are very, they're ready for the metaverse. Okay, if, if you haven't already seen Mark Zuckerberg's uh, lecture on the metaverse, <laughs> now, whether that, I don't think I'm going to live to see that, yeah. but that's really, the students understand that completely, the fusing of virtual reality and, and physical reality. Uh, thank you for that, that's interesting very much, uh, Professor. One last question to all the members uh, who are on the panel. So in Veltech, uh, uh, on the technology integration, if you want to uh, say that this is the best practice being adopted and followed effectively in Veltech, which one you, can, you will quote, sir? One best uh, practice being followed, adopting the technology into your academic process. Uh, actually, we are uh, strong in uh, active learning. Active learning. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, I come to Professor Rum. Uh, Dr. Manogaran. It's a learning curve for the faculty. It will be a little difficult. Okay. So it will take some time. We, we have to train them with a good IT officer. Sir. You mean right. No, we all understand now that uh, from the role of a teacher, an educator role has uh, very much changed after this uh, technology integration. From the role of a uh, teacher to facilitator now, probably uh, it is the time for us to move towards the mentoring role, need uh, more amount of uh, time for teacher education, teacher training, maybe with the, uh, all the advanced tools. Only then may possible with proper technology integration. That's uh, my personal point of view. Anyway, I would like to hear from uh, uh, Professor Murthy also. Yeah. Uh, technology, the way we are looking at is that uh, we're building high-end research labs for addressing the technology challenges of the nation. So uh, we have a new campus and in which uh, we are looking at uh, full-scale test facilities. So that uh, will give the students an opportunity to participate in a live activity of the nation as well as uh, do something that is directly contributing to addressing the need of the nation. So that's another dimension that we have taken to. Coming to digital technologies, I think it is now a common place for us to have uh, you know, much of our content, teaching content in the digital platform. Many of the teachers even share uh, their slides with the students and then uh, they are trying to do the flip class model also. So uh, it is changing, but what I am feeling is that uh, we are putting too many eggs in one basket at two in the undergraduate basket. I don't think that we can load the young uh, shoulders so much. We need to shift some of our expectations to masters and PhD students uh, and re then re really lighten uh, up the all of us. program. I really, uh, not to all of us. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Professor, the best practice being followed by Savita University. See, at Savita, what we do is uh, we have something called a CLAB. 
classroom and the lab together. So we have something called, uh, any classroom, if you see, it looks like a mobile laboratory. So the faculty teaches something, physics, chemistry, or whatever, and then immediately after the class, or in between the class, they'll show you the equipments or whatever uh, is a practical experience, on-the-spot experience. That's what has been the best practice in Savita. Thank you so much, sir. Lab with theory component. That's what we say in, in our engineering system. Professor, one of the best practice, taking technology as support in Sai University. Absolutely. I think that uh, what the uh, professor has said is exactly right. And actually, there's a lot of research in cognitive neuroscience to say that you need to mix as much as possible the theoretical and the practical instead of siloing them completely. Thank you so, so much. And if time permits, we can take one or two questions from the audience side. Yes, please. Can we have two more minutes for some of the audience? Uh, can, can, can you just forward the mic to them, please? Yes. Wonderful panel. You have triggered a lot of uh, points for me to ask you as queries. Number one is, technology has alienated people. I don't know how many of you have gone to the bank very recently. The customer-banker relationship has totally vanished. Yes. I do not know who is my manager and to whom I can complain. They give you some eight-digit number, one, one eight double zero, and it goes on ringing, nobody answers. Similarly, technology in education sector has also alienated the student guru shishya relationship. India was known for Gurukulam, by which the Vedas, Itikas, Upanishads were transmitted from one generation to another. And it is still alive after 5,000, 6,000 years. This technology intervention in education, is it good or bad? Is it going to change the bondage between the teacher and the student relationship? And even online classes, you do not know how many of them are listening. Even on physical classes, people are meddling with mobiles and other devices. So much so, how effective the learning takes place. Even when you talk something, the student goes to Google. For him, the Google is the real guru. He goes to the thing. So how effectively the technology can make learning very efficient and its efficacy can be improved. Another thing is we talk about quality, quantity. The professor said that we are generating so many uh, students. But the pathetic situation is most of the students are unemployable. Day before yesterday, one person came with a sugi and he delivered my food. I asked him, why you are taking this job? He said, sir, I am beta chemical. I am doing this sugi job for 10,000 rupees. What type of education we are giving? What is the effectiveness? What is the end use of the education? Is it for the sake of degrees that we are manufacturing so many students like a, a company manufacturing buckets, screws, the effectiveness of the quality. None of the universities in India is in the top ranks of uh, uh, 50 or uh, 30. Whereas in China, more than nine universities are in the top rank. So where are we going wrong? Sir, are sir, we not going to make sir, an introspection? Sir, we've heard your question. That yes. We've heard your question. Thank you so much. Uh, let me uh, come back straight to your question. Uh, yatha Raja Tatha Praja. If the faculty members conduct themselves uh, in a balanced way with the use of technology, students also will eventually effectively learn that. Right? So we are overtly depending on technology, which is not proper. For those universities where they don't have teachers, dependence is understandable. For those who have teachers, upgrading the quality of teachers is the first priority for all leaders. And what I would suggest is that uh, when it comes to uh, faculty members, employing faculty members, do not do recruitment, please do selection. And go back to the background of that person and see whether he's indeed a service-minded person or a business person. 
and then only choose that person as a faculty member, then you will win with that individual, right? Coming to the matter of uh, uh, the quality that you talked about of graduates, uh, I think we need to tighten our belts. We can't go on too long with this. And it is any amount of uh, oversight by any accreditation body will not help if we are doing it ourselves. We don't need police. We need to be conscious. Every university should rise on the absolute standard and not on the relative standard, right? That's my request for all of us. And this includes all of us which are government-funded institutes also. We have to rise on the absolute scale and not necessarily stay afloat on the relative scale. First of all, I must thank all the panelists. How we are come out of this kind of a challenge uh, in the name of CBCS? Uh, Second to be, one… To, to be frank, sir, I will just yeah. answer for your Please. question, for the, for the first question. Yeah. Uh, in terms of CBCS, right, we need more flexibility, more classrooms, more teachers in our campus, to be frank, uh, yeah. to take yeah. up CBCS. Yeah. Practically, that may not be possible uh, with respect to many institutions. So, even though we claim that we follow CBCS, it's a restricted CBCS, yes, we do agree. Yeah, this is a question addressed to IIT uh, professor. Now, the private universities are able to win the real situation through the selection of proper teachers. Whereas in government sector, we are recruiting teachers, they are not trainers. We are badly in need of trainers than the teacher, from teacher-centric to trainer-centric how the government institutions or government support institution can survive in coming future. Thank you. You and you raised about the best practices. I remember in the, I am Professor B.P. Veerabhadrappa, Vice Chancellor, Kuvempu University, Karnataka. I was very much impressed in the recent Varanasi summit where our Honorable Prime Minister talked about the same issues. Number one, please get into the hearts of the students. Number two, all the vice chancellors should be together. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much for your comments, sir. Uh, can I can I just final remarks? Right, okay. Mm -hmm. The technology integration in uh, as per our new education policy is uh, very much mindful, no doubt on that. The education for the future, uh, no doubt, will uh, involve the greater uh, dematerialization, no doubt, because already we are removing the book materials from our campuses and more digital contents are getting in. Uh, for here to conservative educational system in India, I think this mindfulness is itself a remarkable feat. With this note, uh, I would like to close this uh, panel discussion. Thank you so much, uh, esteemed panelists, who are part of this panel discussion and the audience. A big round of applause, everybody. Such an insightful session. Now I would, I would like to request Swami, Swaminathan AR, co-founder and CEO Camu, to please come on the stage and give mementos to our panelists. Dr. Shivaji Chandram, Vice Chancellor, Savita University. Dr. Jamshid Barucha, Founding Vice Chancellor, Sai University. CVR Murthy, Chair Professor, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Dr. K. Karunakaran, CEO, Hindustan Educational Institute, Coimbatore. Professor S. Selvihanan, Vice Chancellor, Welltech Rangarajan, Dr. Sakundula R&D Institute of Science and Technology. Dr. C. Manoharan, Chairman, NG Hospital and Research Center.
प्रोफेसर एस एल वी हानन वाइस चांसलर वेलटेक रंगरंज रंगाराजन डॉक्टर शगुंतला आर एंड डी इंस्टीट्यूट कैन वी प्लीज हैव अ ग्रुप पिक्चर विद द मैगजीन मैगजीन एंड मोमेंटो बोल या मोमेंटो ऑल्सो This is our special Tamil Nadu issue. Can we have a big round of applause? 